What's happening, folks? Um, back again for another edition of New Maroon Getaway podcast slash vlog. Life examined by an aspiring 21st century maroon. Um, I'm, I'm actually back with another little segment, a little sooner than I thought I would be, but I saw this, um, this uh, series of articles uh, online uh, which was published back in July, but uh, I, I just happened to see them uh, maybe maybe two days ago, uh, written by uh, a, a journalist and an educator I've been I've been following for uh, on and off for a number of years. Uh, he has a organization called the Post Carbon Institute, a guy named Richard Heinberg. So he writes a lot about um, energy and economy and um, ecological issues. Uh, when I first came across him, um, it was when I first started seeing writings about uh, the issue of peak oil. So, um, you know, the implications of oil depletion and how that would sort of influence future prospects for life on the planet and future happenings in, uh, you know, in, in, in human history and, and all of that sort of thing. But uh, just as a, a sort of a general um, topic, the sort of the history of history, the unfolding of history, uh, patterns of history has really been something that I've been uh, quite interested in. Um, and it's funny because the, uh, the whole idea of patterning uh, comes out of um, my experience in undergoing, you know, my, my permaculture training, just that whole idea of pattern, pattern uh, language and systems thinking and how history kind of functions as a, you know, as a system, as, as, a, as a pattern phenomenon. So there are a number of books that I've been, you know, reading or picking through over the last few years. So uh, one of them I, I mentioned the other day, this one, let me just adjust. So Against the Grain, uh, Deep History of the Early Estates. Um, which uh, is really a um, again an examination of of history through the eyes of, of agriculture. Uh, the idea that, um, well, not the idea that apparently agriculture was not necessary in order for um, human beings to live lives as uh, sedentary communities. That um, that actually agriculture had arisen or uh, facilitated the the founding or the establishment of states. And there's a whole um, discussion that uh, we're likely to have about that because there's 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 a great deal in that book that I think is really important. But um, also um, this book, Collapse: How Societies Choose to Fail to Succeed. Excellent, again, excellent text. Again, covering the general topic of how human societies have uh, not only risen but um, how they've how they failed. Probably m- most importantly, how they failed. Uh, understanding. Um, whether or not there happens to be some discernible pattern, you know, behind that phenomenon. Before that book, um, same author, Jared Diamond. This um, this is a book written uh, in the mid '90s called uh, "Guns, Germs, and Steel: uh, The Fate of Human Societies." Again, excellent book, which was written about a decade before the Collapse uh, book was re- was uh, released. Then there's "The Great Leveler" by uh, Walter Scheidel. Violence and the History of Inequality uh, from the Stone Age to the 21st Century. Um, all of these books are, again, um, looking at patterns that one would be able to uh, decipher if, uh, if you look at history with a kind of wide enough or broad enough lens. So when I saw this, um, this, uh, this three-part series from from Richard Heinberg, uh, again, I thought this was, this was fit right into that same lane, that same vein of um, looking at patterns in human history, patterns of human behavior. And in this instance, trying to th- draw a parallel between the patterns, not only that have marked human behavior in human history, but also um, how ecosystems work, how nature functions. And I think this is um, kind of a worthwhile analogy to to look at uh, in in greater depth. 
So I, I wanted to, to start picking through this piece and then maybe just have like kind of a running commentary uh, or, or point out a number of things uh, that he uh, that he's written here. So it's uh, this this is um, yeah, we'll just we'll, we'll just go through this uh, gradually. So it's um, it's it's titled Human Predators, Human Prey, Society as Ecosystem in a Time of Collapse. Uh, I think already the title is um, is pretty uh, it grabs you. Uh, I think the, the 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 analogy of the predator prey relationship that one sees in in um, you know in ecosystems, uh, the 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 idea that you you see a similar relationship in how. Uh, and how human beings, human relations function is already, you know, it's already quite fascinating. So just to start, you know, reading through the piece, uh, he says in the introduction, a lion runs down a gazelle, a raiding band brandishing clubs, bows, and arrows descends on a tribal village. A lone shark confronts a delinquent borrower. In each of these three scenarios, one party seeks to gain at the expense of the other. Without a moment's hesitation, we classify the first interaction between the lion and gazelle as a predator-prey relationship. Biologists and ecologists have studied such relationships in detail for many decades, codifying principles that help us understand and predict the behavior of entire ecosystems. Could we use predator-prey relationships among widely divergent species in nature as a metaphor to help in understanding the behavior of people in complex human societies, in which some people gain at the expense of others. Even the best metaphors have limited usefulness, and this one certainly has potential for misapplication. However, as I hope to show, it also has the ability to illuminate. Now, I think even given the theme or the title of, of my podcast, New Maroon Getaway, uh, this is, this, most definitely ties in with this theme where uh you know the the maroon the runaway slave is uh is is attempting to get away from uh you know again from this predatory relationship that the one that has held them in bondage yeah it's it's, it's he's attempting to try to come out from underneath the you know the you know the hold or the you know be, being being taken advantage of by by someone who would be seen as a predator but by people that would be seen as a predator. And actually, he mentions this in the second part of, of, the, of the essay. So um, just to continue, a complex or stratified human society can be thought of as an ecosystem. Within it, humans, all a single species, because of their differing social classes, roles, and occupations, can act and affect as different species. To the extent that some exploit others, we could say that some act as predators and others as prey. There may even be human analogs to subcategories of predatory behavior such as parasitism and uh, infection. Within, within non-human species in nature, forms of competition or exploitation unquestionably exist. For example, when a shoe bill gives birth to two chicks, the mother and father tend to favor one of them. Then the favored offspring attacks the unfavored, which inevitably dies. Bull elk battle one another for mating privileges, sometimes to the death. But the extent and variety of human ways of exploiting other humans defy comparison with the behavior of any other animal, hence the predation metaphor. Human groups have preyed upon one another via two main pathways, intragroup and intergroup, which have often intersected or run parallel. Members of a complex society can prey upon other members of the, of the same society via slavery, which including sex slavery and debt slavery, caste, class, taxes, rents, crime, and debt. On the other hand, one society can prey upon a different society through raid, invasion, plunder, conquest, colonization, or again, debt. In addition, members of conquered prey societies can be enslaved by or absorbed into the predator society, becoming a permanent underclass. 
Speaking informally of human economic exploitation of other humans in terms of predation is hardly new, as we will see. However, a cursory search of the literature turned up few systematic explorations of the metaphor. In discussing the phenomenon of predation, I'm not so much interested in cases in which some humans actually eat others, though this did happen in some societies, but rather in forms of economic exploitation. In order to emphasize the metaphoric nature of this usage, I'll use quotation marks in every instance which terms like uh, predator or prey are being applied to relations among and between humans. My main objective here is to use the predator-prey frame to see whether we can gain some insight into society, especially in its current context. This is not a static context. Instead, it is a highly dynamic and perilous situation dominated by our society's collision with ecological limits to further growth, including climate change, resource depletion, and species extinctions. We urgently need, we urgently need to understand this context better so as to predict, or at least in broad strokes, where our social ecosystem, quote unquote, may be headed. To change course in instances where there is still time to avert severe harm, and to better adapt to whether, to whatever impacts are already inevitable. The basic premise of you know the whole idea behind New Maroon Getaway is to is to sort of imagine what marinage in in this current context that he's speaking of against this backdrop. What would marinage look like? So. Um, yeah, this is, this is, uh, this is definitely a, a worthwhile, uh, you know, worthwhile, uh, conversation to have. To the second section of the essay, uh, and this one's titled, uh, Predator-Prey Relationships in Nature. So predator-prey relationships are the result of hundreds of millions of years of evolution <clears throat> and form the warp and weft of the food web. Predators often evolve to have sharp teeth and talons while prey species typically evolve features and behaviors that enable them to hide or, or to escape or hide. The details of adaptation and specialization are wondrous and multitudinous. These relationships are an important means by which energy moves through the biosphere. The food web has three main elements. Yeah, and this is, this is hilarious because I, I talk about this all the time. <laughs> Predators are autotrophs. Uh, which would include plants and algae, are organisms that use energy from sunlight along with elements from air, soil, rain, or ocean to build their energy storing tissues. And when we say energy, um, energy, if we use uh, the, the common definition that you'll hear in your, you know, it's like a, a, a basic physics course, energy is just the ability to do work. It's, it's, it's your ability to actually do things, right? And so energy is what, um, that, that is how it is basically defined. Secondly, the, the category of consumers or heterotrophs, organisms that consume other organisms, consists of animals that eat primary producers called herbivores, and these animals, and animals that eat other animals called carnivores, and animals that eat both plants and other animals called, called omnivores, which is what we are. And you have decomposers, also called detritivores. They break down dead plant and animal, t animal materials and wastes and release them as energy and nutrients into the ecosystem for recycling. The category of consumers splits further into secondary and tertiary consumers, i.e. carnivores that eat other carnivores, such as seals that eat penguins or snakes that eat frogs, that eat insects, that eat, each that eat other insects. These are the trophic levels or well, again, he's describing what's called the trophic cascade, um, by which energy moves through an ecosystem. At each stage, most energy and materials are lost as heat and waste, rather than being converted into work or tissues. That's why a typical terrestrial ecosystem can support only one carnivore to 10 or more herbivores of similar body mass. One secondary carnivore to every 10 or more primary carnivores and so on. 
most ocean ecosystems are characterized by an inverted food pyramid in which consumers outweigh producers. This happens because primary producers have a rapid turnover of biomass on the order of days, while consumers' biomass turns over much more slowly, a few years in the case of many fish species. If energy is a main driver of the ecosystem, it is also a main limit, along with water and nutrients. Predators keep the population levels of prey species in check, but a decline in the population of prey species due to any cause, including overpredation, can lead to a fall in the population of predators. Typically, the abundance of prey and predators is characterized by cycles, with the population uh, peaks of predators often lagging those of prey. Using tools, language, and agriculture, early humans gradually found ways to overcome several key natural checks and balances. With our weapons, we can kill off our predators like lions and tigers. Now, the only large, but uh, now the, the, the only large bodied direct challengers we had to worry about were the humans. We could expand into new territories. We could adapt to using new and different resources. As a result, the total human population tended to grow slowly over thousands of years with occasional setbacks. Still, there were limiting factors, one of which was energy. There you go, that word again. As long as we depended on firewood for fuel, our numbers were partly limited by availability of trees. Uh, ancient civilizations consumed forest after forest. Indeed, one of the oldest known human stories, the Epic of Gilgamesh, revolves around the hero chopping down trees and the resulting deforestation was sometimes associated with the decline of civilizations. As a matter of fact, that is precisely one of the, the, the main uh, causes of civilizational collapse that's mentioned by, by Diamond in his book. If you go in, either read the book or able to see a summary of the book, um, he names eight causes of civilizational collapse, historically speaking, and then he, he names of, of four future uh, uh, likely causes for civilizational collapse. But the top three he names are um, deforestation and habitat destruction, as, as mentioned here. And then, um, and then he, 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 he mentioned soil problems, which, in, which would include uh, soil erosion and salinization, which is salting of soils, and the loss of fertility. And then the last one is, is water problems, water management problems. Uh, when, when you, again, you look at this stuff and you, and you start to connect the dots, you realize that you know, th these aren't three separate problems, that they're all, they're all actually the same problem. Uh, or one is the logical outcome of the of the problem that preceded it so um so again this is this is all kind of embedded in in what he's he's um and what heinberg's talking about here so he says here uh but in the last few centuries and especially the last decades fossil fuels began to substitute for firewood this substitution enabled a massive increase in the global human population so here he has uh predator prey relationships make ecosystems dynamic and complex Efforts to understand that dynamism and complexity have led to the development of resilient science and to a key concept known as the adaptive cycle. This describes the cycle of resource organization, growth or exploitation, conservation, and release that ecosystems have been observed to follow. For example, in a ponderosa pine forest, the collective behavior of plants and animals organizes itself in a predictable pattern. First, following a disturbance, hardly an adaptable pioneer species, quote unquote, of plants and small animals fill in open niches and reproduce rapidly. Over time, those species that can take advantage of relationships with other species start to dominate. These relationships make the system more stable, but at the expense of diversity. Resources like nutrients, water, and light are so taken up by the dominant species that the system as a whole loses its flexibility to deal with changing conditions. Finally, these trends accumulate to make the system susceptible to a crash, say a wildfire. Many trees die, releasing their nutrients, opening the forest canopy to let more light in, and providing habitat for shrubs and small animals, and the cycle starts over. Uh, some, resilient science, uh, some resilient scientists have observed that the adaptive cycle also characterizes the evolution of human societies, which likewise go through periods of growth conservation, release, and reorganization. 
ancient China, for example, saw several such cycles. Throughout the remainder of this essay, I will be discussing the adaptive cycle primarily as it relates to human society and especially to the current crisis of global industrial society. Um, I'm, I'm running out of, uh, I'm running out of, uh, memory.